I'm going to talk about uh, theory uh, in an industrial lab. And I'm just going to talk about many uh, aspects of it that I'm, I'm not sure that you're all aware of. Uh, for, first of all, there are two types of research. Uh, one is called basic, and the other is called applied. And it turns out the definitions have nothing to do with how fundamental the research is. Uh, the definitions have, why are you doing it? Uh, applied research is research you're doing to solve a specific problem. Basic research is research you're doing because you're curious about something. There doesn't have to be any application. Um, I'm going to mention something else is, uh, why, why do universities hire researchers for faculty? If the mission of a university is to produce the next generation of talent, why are we hiring researchers? And the answer is, is that when you hire a faculty member, they're going to have maybe a 40-year career. And what you would like them is to grow during those 40 years as the field grows. Uh, and if someone is doing basic research, something they're just curious about, if something happens in their field, they'll probably be curious about it and will develop, and they will grow with the field. Uh, secondly, uh, the course they're teaching, uh, when something new happens, will probably get included. And so the course will be modern. And, and also there is the thing that I think people doing basic research, their fundamental nature is they're just excited about what they're doing and they will bring this excitement uh, to their class. So, so that's uh, uh, the reason universities uh, hire researchers for faculty. Uh, but why does a, a company hire a basic researcher? Because a, a company is presumably interested in getting products out. Well, one of, one of the reasons uh, is they would like to have a few of their researchers going to international conferences around the world so that if anything happens in science, which is going to have a significant impact on the company, they, they will hear, hear about it. Uh, I, I might just mention I have a granddaughter who took a job, and all of a sudden I noticed that her job seemed to be to travel around the world. So I asked her what she was doing. And she was hired simply to go to international conferences uh, in the area important to the company so that if anything happened, they, they would hear about it. I'm also going to talk about the definition of theoretical research in computer science. Uh, because some words uh, have two different meanings. And depending on who you're talking to, it can be different. Uh, when I started, uh, theoretical uh, computer science was involved with just a small number of items. It was concerned with finite automata, context-free languages, computability, uh, decidability, and things like that. Uh, and that was because when the discipline started, uh, the discipline simply consisted of this portion of theoretical computer science and programming. Uh, the area of algorithms didn't exist. Uh, but today, um, computer science has changed. Uh, initially, it was concerned with making computers useful. Uh, but today, computers are useful. And computer science has changed to uh, what are computers being used for. And so now, there are all kinds of, of applications, AI, big data, uh, cryptography. Uh, and what theoretical computer science is today is those people who are interested in the underlying ideas of an application. Uh, people who want to know, why does AI work? Uh, sort of as, a, as opposed to somebody who simply wants to take AI and, uh, and apply it to, to problems. Um, now, Microsoft Research Asia I believe, needs to focus on helping the company with certain uh, specific areas. But one way uh, to help 
is uh, by having a, a theory. And if, if you're working on a specific problem, uh, you've, you've got to spend most of your time in trying to solve that problem. But if what you do is if you take 5% of your time and uh, just ask theoretically, can we develop a theory of this area? What you might do is you might discover some other way of solving the problem and do it in a much more efficient uh, manner. Um, so one thing I should point out is that companies usually don't hire very many basic researchers uh, because they have a short-term aspect. And so they want to just hire people who are going to solve problems. Uh, but there is one example where a company was different, and that was Bell Laboratories. And this was a special case uh, because they were uh, controlled by the government. And the more money they spent on basic research, uh, the, the amount of profit they could make was a certain percentage of their budget. So the bigger their budget was, the more profit they could make. And so they spent a lot of money on basic research. And they hired people who were just doing what they were curious about. And if you look at Bell Labs, the research accomplishments that they made, it was fantastic. But the reason that other companies don't duplicate it is because they have a short-term view. And they want to solve issues that will get products out. Uh, but it turns out, if you're willing to take a long-term view and do basic research, uh, you will actually be, uh, uh, have a much bigger impact. Uh, I would like to talk about another area because it brings up a research area that might be in of interest to you. Uh, but I should caution you, uh, if, if I suggest a research area, I would suggest you avoid it unless you're really curious about it. And the, and the reason for that, if you're going to be a successful researcher, you ought to focus on what you're curious about, not, not in what people suggest you, you work on. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, education. Uh, and I've, I have been working for about 10 years trying to improve ed education, uh, university undergraduate education in China. And uh, one of the things is a number of years ago, your, your premier asked me to uh, chair an international advisory board on how to improve education in China. Uh, and we, we developed... Um, uh, a report, and he gave it to the Minister of Education to implement. And basically what we said is you have to change the metrics by which uh, faculty are evaluated. Uh, don't look at the amount of research money brought in, don't look at the number of papers published, but evaluate uh, how good an, a, a teacher is the faculty member and their professional reputation as viewed by international experts. Now, the Ministry of Education didn't do a very good job in implementing this. Uh, so I got permission uh, to evaluate uh, computer science education at the top 50 universities in China. And, and the way we did it was we had somebody sit in on a lecture and see if the faculty member was engaging the students. And then we also measured what fraction of the students were paying attention. And, and we had a scorecard where there were actually five things we, we evaluated. <clears throat> but it turns out that in evaluating lectures, you, get, you, you acquire a large amount of information which is useful, would be useful for the person teaching the lecture uh, to improve their teaching. And, and I'm going to tell you a story of one lecture I sat in uh, so that you'll get the point. Uh, this was a world-class teacher. Uh, she had a class of 30 students, and I was sitting in the back row, and I observed that during the first half hour, she was engaging the students, and every student was listening. And they were sitting there, they were taking notes, and there was a good uh, exchange. But then something happened, and all of a sudden, 
half of the class took out their iPhones and disengaged. And so I wondered what caused this. Uh, the course, by the way, was in Mandarin, so I, I, I didn't know exactly what she was saying. But I noticed that she wrote on the board a mathematical theorem because I could see the for all there exist signs. And what I believe happened uh, was that the students just saw this theorem. They didn't really understand it. Uh, they knew a proof was going to be coming, and so they had better use of their time. Now, I, I never try to tell a faculty member how to improve their lecture, because they'll probably ignore it if I do. So what I did instead is I engaged her in a discussion. I simply told her what happened and said, maybe let's just talk about how we could have kept all those students involved. And what we came up with was um, maybe instead of writing a mathematical formula down for the theorem, why don't you intuitively explain what the theorem is about and why it's important and how it's used. And then, I, oh, I noticed that afterwards she spent 20 minutes proving the theorem. And so I, I asked her, I said, in this lecture, what would you like students to remember six months from now? And we both agreed that it was not the proof of the theorem. So the suggestion was, uh, instead of proving the theorem, why don't you tell the students what are the key techniques or key points you would need to have to, to prove the theorem? And in enough detail so that afterwards, if they wanted to, they could write out a proof of the theorem. Because they might remember uh, what was important uh, in proving it. Now, um, it seemed to me that we ought to make use of the information we learn. Uh, because I, I have 200 faculty who are sitting in on lectures, evaluating them. Uh, maybe we should, instead of evaluating, uh, we should work with the faculty who are teaching to improve their teaching. Uh, I mentioned this, uh, the president of Shanghai Xiaotong University, he grasped the idea and is implementing it. Uh, mentioned it at PKU. President grasped the idea, he's implementing it. Um, I'm working with the vice mayor of Shanghai. Uh, he wants to improve education at nine universities. Uh, he grasped it, the idea he is. And then I had a meeting with your minister of education. Um, and uh, it turns out when I went to the meeting, the president of PKU uh, went with me. Uh, and the minister of education uh, designated, told the president of PKU, assemble a team in China and see if this really works. Uh, and if it does, uh, in July, give me a strategy for implementing it at the top 77 universities in China. The reason I mention this to you is there's a research problem here. And it might be something, if you're excited about, you might think about. Uh, up until now, uh, in a classroom, we put a camera in the back of the room watching the lecture uh, so that we could record the lecture, and if someone missed the lecture, they could listen to it later. Why don't we also put a camera in the front of the classroom watching the students? And could we develop uh, maybe an AI system which would tell us what fraction of the students are paying attention uh, and basically determine what's going on in the classroom. And could we correlate that with what is happening, what the lecture is saying and what they're doing? And could we automatically produce information which we could feed to the teacher which says, uh, here's maybe something you should consider, here's what's happened, and uh, maybe you could in improve your, your lecturing. Uh, now, uh, this kind of technology, of course, could be used in many other ways. Uh, but uh, it, it's something that is, I think, very, very important. Um, and something I'll just mention, um, the word vector model. 
Uh, when this was developed, and it was ac actually developed by a faculty member at Cornell University, and we didn't think very much about it, <laughs> or that it was going to be a very influential thing. But it turns out that things that you may not think are important may lead to entirely new areas, because this is the technology which really makes Google successful. And it's created millions of jobs. Uh, unfortunately, the faculty member never really got credit for, for what he did. Um, but there are just many things that I think are important to consider. Uh, one of them is if we train an AI network uh, to recognize a cat, um, it, it turns out we have to use thousands of images. Uh, but I know that a human learns from a single image. And what we might do is we might look at the, uh, how the brain works, because the organization of the brain is fundamentally different. Uh, than, than that of a computer, and maybe uh, we could extract something. Uh, because the brain also uses incredibly low amounts of energy, uh, whereas uh, our com computers are, are using an enormous amount. And what is it about the architecture of the brain that allows it to do certain things um, that uh, very easily that are very hard for us uh, in, in AI. And one of the reasons I mention this is I want to get across the notion that it's important, rather than to just focus on what you're doing, uh, to look at what other people are doing. And you may pick up an idea from a totally different area, uh, which is going to be uh, in, important for you. Um, I'll, I'll just men tell you another story, uh, because I have become interested in how the brain learns. Um, and, oh, 70 years ago, somebody told me uh, the first three years of a child's life is going to determine how successful they'll be. And I kind of just ignored it, because I thought this was something people just kind of assumed, but there was no science to support it. Uh, but more recently, I met somebody, uh, and they said, uh, they told me the same story, and I asked, is, is there research to support this? Um, and it turns out, when I searched the, the research, there is a tremendous amount of research on how the brain develops. Uh, and it turns out, uh, in the first three years of a child's life, the brain learns how to learn. And people have done studies uh, 30 years ago where they went into an inner city in the United States and stabilized and provided an intellectually rich environment for the first three years of a, one group of children, but not for another. And then 30 years later, they compared what is the difference. Uh, and it turns out those that had the intellectually rich environment, there were significantly fewer mental problems uh, there were higher educational levels, there were higher, uh, uh, they were working at, for higher salaries. And if you look at the return on investment to the nation, uh, this is one of the best investments you could make. Uh, and um, I'll tell you uh, how you learn things, though, by talking to people. There is a researcher here in China at PK University who is trying to figure out uh, what is a good intellectual environment for a child when they're born? And I said to her, I said, it must be hard to do research if you have to wait 30 years to determine the outcome. And she says, oh, no, no, that's not what we do. Uh, what we do is we use the mouse as a proxy for a human. And it turns out that the brain in the mouse develops the same way that the brain in a human does. And so we purchase 100 mice. Uh, we put 50 of them just in a cage. And we put the other 50 in a cage with an intellectually rich environment. Uh, and we leave them that way for three weeks. Then we put them together. And we test them after two years. And the mice that had the intellectually rich environment uh, do much better on tests and mazes and things like that. 
So I asked, what's an intellectually rich environment for a mouse? <laughs> and sure enough, she sent me a, a picture, and each item was labeled in what part of the brain it, it developed. But I, I mention these things because these stories are always uh, related to other things. I mean, here in computer science, quite often we use proxies. Uh, for example, we know how to do convex programming if we're using a two-norm. Uh, we also know how to do it if we're using a one-norm. But we don't have a, an algorithm for a zero-norm. Uh, so what we do instead is we use the one-norm as a proxy for the zero-norm. And most of the time, uh, it gives the optimal answer. And so the question comes up, why, why does a certain proxy work? Uh, that, to me, is an intellectually rich uh, environment, uh, research problem. Uh, what you can do is you can say, if I'm in high dimensions and I have a sphere, and I want to find the minimum zero norm point in the sphere, uh, you can quite easily prove that with high probability, uh, using the one norm will give you the exact correct answer. But it would be interesting to, to see if you could prove a little bit more clearly uh, when, when it works. But one thing I hope that you will walk away with is that if you want to be successful, you should focus on research that really excites you, that you're really curious about. Um, it's, it's something that I also tell students uh, because I discover that many students are majoring in computer science uh, because their parents told them, major in computer science and you'll get a good job. Uh, but I was talking to one as a senior who's going to graduate, and he said, I, you know, I really hate computer science. Uh, I would much rather prefer music. Uh, so what, what I tell even students is you ought to major in what you enjoy. Uh, because your career is going to be a big piece of your life, and, and you want to have a, 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 an exciting life. Um, and, and I'll mention, uh, those if, there's some, if there are any faculty, is the mission of the university is not to train somebody uh, to get a good job. Uh, the mission is to educate students to have a good life. And that's why the education should be more than just a narrow technical area. That's why we ins insist on humanities, social sciences. Because uh, imagine if you got a job in government and all you knew was this narrow technical area. You probably would make some bad mistakes. Uh, same if you go to work for a company and move up in, in management. So, so spend a little time thinking about what you really enjoy. Uh, or curious about. I mean, maybe quantum communication and entanglement theory. Uh, theory. Uh, maybe distributed computing. Uh, uh, big, big data. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are applications now of computing, of computers in medicine, finance, manufacturing. Th this is what computer science is today. Um, and there's cryptography, there's security, there's, there's all kinds of, of important things. Uh, but coming, coming back to theory in an industrial lab, uh, uh, Microsoft Research Asia does have to make some commitment to Microsoft. Uh, and so there, there are certain areas that are important. And, you know, if you're going to focus on one of them, uh, do spend 5% of your time uh, thinking of other ideas, because what you may do is you may find a much better way to solve a problem, uh, or, um, and you're likely to, to be more effective. So I'm, I'm going to stop there, because I would, I would rather uh, talk about what you would like to talk about <laughs> rather than what I thought you might be interested in.